Not this is the start idea. of a multi-year movement, just, and we won't yeah, stop until advice. we end America's war on the poor. All right. All right. All right. Now we'll have a performance by Bread and Puppet Theater. They are one of the oldest nonprofit self-supporting theatrical companies in the country. Woo. Bread and Puppet yeah. is a politically radical puppet theater. The radicals like us, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Active since the 1960s. Their home is Glover, Vermont. And Bread and, Pupper, Bread and Puppet is a network of volunteers using art that is homemade and which reflects on and addresses the concerns of the world and celebrates its beauty. Yeah. Thank you, Bread and Puppet, for joining the Poor People's Campaign.
And now, we will funeralize the gun. Not funny. I'm Rachel Siegel. I'm with the Peace and Justice Center. Really happy to be here with, as part of the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. It is a glorious day, right? Yeah. It's a glorious day for solidarity and for resistance. Yeah. That's right. We know that the war economy disproportionately affects poor people and people of color and that our country, instead of investing in social and economic programs, that would invest in our future and our well-being. Our country prioritizes investing in weapons and in war. I'm gonna read a quote from Reverend Barber's sermon on May 6th. He said, better than I can, overcommitment to militarism and war has completely distorted our economy. So our country, the wealthiest country in history, is the only developed country that does not provide health care to all of its people. That's right. That's messed up. That's in our country, the wealthiest country in the world, women are more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than in any other developed country. In Washington, D.C., the capital of the wealthiest country in history, the death rate is the highest in the country, and it varies by race, with black women more than three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. Shame! Shame! Shame. Side note, there's an amazing article in the New York Times Magazine about this. Reverend Barber goes on, why? Not because we are a poor country, not because we can't afford health care, 
or first class education or good union jobs and a decent infrastructure for our country, but because our economy is first a war economy before it is an uplifting our people economy. That's right. Shame. That's right. Shame. So he said it well. I have a couple of other thoughts to add. We know that militarism is not militarism isn't simply a problem because it's morally despicable and devastates people's lives. It's also something that amplifies other problems. When young people get recruited into the armed forces, they don't necessarily know what they're getting recruited into. They are deceived and lied to. And sometimes when they return from combat zones, they're likely to develop conditions that stay with them for life. These people are often preyed on because they have a lack of options. That's immoral. Um, they are exploited economically. Workers that are turned into murderers because they have no other source of income. We also know that the people who live in countries that are most terrorized by our, by our military are people of color. And so racism plays a role in militarism. That's right. And when communities here in the United States are harmed by nuclear manufacturing, it's largely indigenous and poor people. We just had the pleasure of hosting a woman, Beata Sosi Pena, for the Vermont Peace Conference in Burlington. I know a couple of you heard her. She's from New Mexico, and the nuclear weapons manufacturing complex near her home of Santa Clara Pueblo pollutes the water and causes sickness, especially cancer, in the women. Not only that, but the chemicals have been found in their breast milk. But here's where we need to look at the intersectionality if we're gonna really address this fully. That very place that's profiting while making them sick is one of their only options for employment. So the people who live in this community also work at the factory. If we simply close the factory, what will the workers do? This is not simple. We need to look at the places where racism, worker exploitation, poverty, and climate destruction overlap. And that's how this campaign was started when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. initiated it. Here in Vermont, Century Arms is making AKs and other guns in Fairfax, Franklin County. Hey! And we know that Franklin County is not a wealthy place. So again, we need to look for a just solution that doesn't just take away people's jobs. That's right. Yep. That's an argument that's also been made in favor of the F-35s, the job argument. They say that if we don't get the F-35s at the Burlington International Airport for our Air Guard, we'll lose jobs and it'll hurt the economy. But we know that this is not true from a statement that the Air Force themselves made that said we will not lose jobs if they don't come. They will find a different mission. That's true. And we know that the people who are most impacted by the F-16s currently and who will be even more impacted by the F-35s are the folks in Winooski, Vermont, which is the community that has the most former refugees in Vermont. So these are people who've been devastated by war that we participated in and now they're getting put in a place where their lives are going to be diminished, their children will be impacted, their health will be impacted because of war. Look out. Shame. Oh, shame. I want to read one more thing from somebody else before I introduce our speaker. This is Kathy Kelly, who went to Afghanistan. She was in Kabul working with a Peace Volunteer Initiative, working with a group of students, and she says she was talking to them about the school shootings in the United States. This was um, right after the shooting in Parkland. It's March 1st that she wrote this. I tell some of the Afghan Peace Volunteer students about the school shootings in the United States and the remarkable determination of teenagers from Florida and elsewhere we know, to demand that lawmakers take action on gun control. These Afghan students have also heard about Black Lives Matter activists who've been tear gassed and beaten when they've demonstrated against police brutality. The Afghan teens identify with the activists facing danger but still standing up to insist on change. I, Kathy Kelly, asked if they thought that the US media and government would heed Afghan young people raising their voices asserting their anguish and fear regarding U.S. aerial attacks and drone assassinations, which they live with daily. You're dreaming, said Hamad, one of the students. He flashed me a warm smile and shook his head, saying no one will ever listen to us. Nasir, a third-year university student who majors in mapping technology, tells me he thinks teens in the United States have a chance to be heard. 
Like Habib, he doubts that the same is true for Afghan voices seeking to end the 16-year-old war they live in. But Zanab, a high schooler in the class, added that she thinks it would be great to record a vigil of teenagers in Kabul, sending their support for U.S. teenagers who've survived school shootings and who've begun shaming the adult world into action on the issue of gun violence. The outrage now directed toward the National Rifle Association should also challenge all assaults made by the U.S. military. Could international teen solidarity challenge both the U.S. military and the National Rifle Association to end assaults on human life? Our goal must be to demand that every person around the world agree to stop producing and using weapons, says Nasir. Courageous, clear-eyed Afghan and U.S. youth are working in both countries to sow seeds that bear needed fruit, hoping they can change the adults as well. So we tried to get high school students here, but they're in school. They uh, don't have as many options as adults in many ways, and they are kicking butt all over Vermont right now. So go look for some high school students to support. So today, a day after Memorial Day, we remember all the people who died in unnecessary war, children and families in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Palestine, and elsewhere, because of decisions to promote war instead of peace. The support of the Israeli army by our government is currently part of the cruelty that's happening in Gaza. And our next speaker is Kathy Shapiro. She's an activist with Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. And I will let her tell you more about that. Thank you very much for um, the opportunity to include the struggle of Palestinians in this rally today for the Poor People's Campaign. Um, thank you. Um, just a note about VTJP, Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. We work to support the survival of the Palestinian people and to end the 50-year-long illegal Israeli occupation. We are committed to full civil and political rights and self-determination for all Palestinians to promote equality and safety of both Palestinians and Israelis. We also recognize that the struggle for Palestinian rights is inextricably linked to the struggles for poor, minority, and indigenous people of the United States. Yep. It's a struggle against militarism and policing uh, that are used to protect the interests of the rich and powerful. But what does Palestine have to do with militarism in America and our own engorged military budget? Here's how two of today's commands, uh, sorry, demands are connected to the U.S.-Israel alliance against Palestinians. One, the demand that asks for demilitarization of our communities on the border, in our interiors, and an end to federal programs that send military equipment to our state and local communities. Israel is the largest recipient of U.S. military aid, receiving almost $4 billion a year. That's more than $10 million every single day of our tax dollars. Hey. Hey. The U.S. and Israel have a lot in common. Both countries are founded on settler colonialism, while white, white Europeans coming to foreign lands and subduing or eliminating indigenous people. Both countries treat protest movements as a military threat. Look at the militarized forces that met nonviolent DAPL demonstrators and the people of Ferguson. Look at the IDF snipers that picked off one by one young men and women in Gaza as they demonstrated nonviolently in cold blood, killing 107 of them and injuring more than 12,000 civilians over 6,000 of them so seriously that they'll be handicapped for the rest of their lives, many with amputations. Shame. That's immoral. Hey. Immoral. Hey. Come on. Right. Hey. Israel prides itself on the development of state-of-the-art weapons and surveillance equipment, and it markets it to the rest of the world as already tested in the field. Who is it tested on? Palestinians. In testing these weapons and marketing them, they promote Islamophobia in the name of counterterrorism, much the same as the US 
enforces law and promotes racial discrimination in the name of our community's safety. Since the year 2000, Israeli and the U.S. have, have been engaging in police exchange programs, bringing together police, ICE, border control agents, campus police, and FBI from our country to Israel to meet with police, border agents in Israel, police, border agents, and the army in Israel. In these programs, worst practices are exchanged that exist in both countries, including extrajudicial ex ex executions, shoot to kill orders, policies of police murder, racial profiling, massive spotting, surveillance, deportation, detention, and attacks on unarmed human rights defenders. No e more. Even Vermont has participated in such exchanges in the past and we need to ensure that never happens again. That's right, come on! That's right! The second demand I want to address is to cease the call for building a wall at our border with Mexico. Israeli contractors, Israeli contractors have been intimately involved in our own security at the borders. To give only one example, Elbit Systems, one of Israel's most successful military tech companies, has played a key role on the U.S.-Mexican border through construction of surveillance towers, the same that are used at checkpoints within occupied Palestine and at the borders of Israel, that control, contain, and humiliate Palestinians on a daily basis. They are the first people who would be engaged to build a wall that walls us off from the country of Mexico, should that actually come to pass. Palestine is important because Israel's war on Palestinians has become a model and a laboratory for a global war against we the people, including our own. U.S.-backed militarism has a devastating humanitarian impact that threatens lives and civil liberties of ourselves and people all around the world. As we struggle for the rights of Palestinians, we join you in the fight for the rights of our own communities against the militarist, racist, imperialist powers that control both governments. We will not be free until all are free. That's Thank right. you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. the historical person here today. We're looking back 50 years to uh, 1968 when uh, nonviolence really got going at the time of the first Poor People's Campaign. But I want to take us all the way back to 100 years ago. That was when World War I was ending, 1915, 1917. But uh, the person I would like to bring before you today is my grandmother, Lola Maverick Lloyd, who tried to end World War I with a group of women. She left the United States, crossed the Atlantic. The war had already started. There were submarines everywhere. She met with other women from the other side whose husbands and fathers were possibly fighting uh, people from the, the other side, England and France and Germany. And from their conference, they went to try to, oops, try to uh, get the, uh, the nonviolent, try to get the neutral countries and the warring countries to talk to each other and propose mediation. I mean, they were just saying, it's time for you to stop killing each other, you have to talk to each other, you have to support mediation, you have to support conciliation, you have to make agreements that are supported by law, and if there is, uh, if, if it's only the vanquished and the victors 
that make agreements at the end, you can be sure that the settlement will not be um, really lasting. And of course, that was the Versailles Treaty, which really laid the groundwork for uh, the Second World War. So I'm just uh, trying to say that, uh, you know, people claim that brutality and force is, is the default position for mankind. But I believe, and I think all of you who are here today believe, that there is a powerful counterforce that declares that war and nonviolence can build a powerful path away from violence, and it must be practiced with commitment and diligence, as we are doing today. That's right. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Let's do it. The point is, mediation does work. It's active. It, it, it's in active use, thousands of times a day. It, it's called getting along together or cooperation. You talk rather than yell. You listen. You seek compromise. You treat all as equals. And that's what needs to be happen, happening now. We need an affirmation of moral values. Diplomacy, right. diplomacy not threats. All right. Compassion yeah. rather than bullying. Yeah. Yeah. Both globally and locally. Yeah. Police forces around the nation need to back off from using violence on nonviolent community members and on directing their force against people of color. That's right. Yeah. Yep. That's right. It's, it's outrageous that last summer, the Justice Department renewed permission for armored vehicles, large caliber weapons, ammunition, and other heavy equipment to be repurposed from foreign battlefields to America's streets. No! Right. Shame. Shame. There has been a militarization of law enforcement over the last few decades, even in Vermont, where the Burlington Police Department has used tasers and rubber bullets on community members. Whoa. This is just Whoa. the tip of the iceberg that the way militarism has seeped its way into our society. So we're building a movement here today for justice. We're all as mad as hell. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We're going to change the things now. Yeah. Um, right. To just conclude, my grandmother and her colleagues did not stop war, did not stop World War I, but they formed an organization that still exists today and is one of the sponsors of the Poor People's Campaign the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. All right! Yeah. 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 103 years old and still marching. Yeah. Yeah. All right! All right! Yeah. All right! Yeah. All right! All right, Robin! Thank you! Thank you. Thank you. All right. I would very much like to introduce Reverend Dr. Leon Dunkley. He's the minister of the North Chapel Universalist Church in Woodstock, Vermont. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. Hi. Um, I, got, I got you, my brother. Hi. Uh, there was a uh, conference that I went to once in Texas, uh, in Fort Worth. And there were people all around that were wearing the same buttons. This siren is sort of like what it feels like inside my heart right now. Being there. But all around, all around Fort Worth, Texas, there was um, uh, people wearing the same buttons. And the buttons all said the same things. They were worn on hats and lapels and on rear ends and on <laughs> pocketbooks. And they said, the most radical thing we can do is introduce ourselves to one another. All right. All right. Yeah. So there if you, you could, just pause for a second. Look at the beauty of this day. Look at the row of flowers that's being planted behind you. All right, all right! Yeah. Yeah. The beauty of the sky and the beauty of your own heart. And let us remember who we are. There's an old song called Long Kesh um, that we sung once. I uh, went to see the gravesite of a man named James Cheney. Is that name familiar with you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. so James Cheney, uh, we went to his gravesite in uh, Mississippi. 
And we, sent, uh, we sang a song that uh, sounded like this. I'll just sing one verse and then share the words with you. It said, um, I went down to Long Kesh to see Bobby Sands. He was not there, but his spirit kept on walking. I could see his smiling face on the men and on the women and the children. They sang freedom songs. And then there was another one. I went down. Sing this one with me. Mississippi. I went down to Mississippi. Fannie Lou Hamer. To see Fannie Lou Hamer. She was not there, but her spirit kept on walking. I could see her smiling face on the men and on the women and the children. They sang. And it goes through several other people. It goes to Atlanta mm -hmm. to see Martin King. Yep. It goes to India mm -hmm. to see Mahatma Gandhi. It goes to Belfast mm -hmm. to see Bernadette Devlin. Mm -hmm. And all the time we're singing together and we're remembering who we are. We're breathing together and remembering who we are. The most radical thing we can do is introduce ourselves to one another. Good afternoon. Good it's afternoon. Good to be with you. Thank you for being here. My name is uh, Leon Dunkley. Uh, I serve the North Universalist Chapel Society in Woodstock, Vermont. It's an honor to be here in Montpelier, in the capital of this great state, among these hills and mountains, green again after months yes. of winter. It's an honor to be a part of this great day of peace and to speak with people who will push themselves to the limit to tell the truth of their own story. Uh, it is an honor to protest here. Protest, mm -hmm. meaning to testify in favor of something. That's yes. right. It's a positive thing to dream the good world into being and to testify, to That's speak right. in favor of the way of grace and beauty. We yeah. protest. Yes. It's yeah. a positive thing to struggle against that which, mag which magnifies human suffering. And it's beautiful to work for that which relieves the pain. Yes. And so we protest. It's a positive thing to know and to long for life's gifts and blessings, to speak out loud on their behalf, so we protest. Right. John Dewey yeah. once said that government is the shadow cast by big business over society. Oh. But he wasn't thinking of any of us. That's right. He was preserving the best in us. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, how do you get past the outrage of what's going on in our world, the militarism, the racism, the systemic and violences? the systemic violences, the systemic injustices. How do we put down the fear that it takes, uh, that, that wants to keep us separate from one another? Mm, Martin Luther yeah. King said, now more than ever before, he was thinking about the, 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 the difficulty of poverty and racism and systemic injustice in mm -hmm. the world. He said, now more than ever, the wor more than ever before, the, uh, we are forced to grapple with this particular question because the world does not afford us the luxury of an anemic democracy. That's right. Mm. That's right. And uh, the, the, the cost that this nation must pay for the segregation of the Negro and other racial groups is the price of its own destruction for the hours late. The clock of destiny is ticking out, and we must act now before it is too late. How do you reset that clock of destiny? It's a real question. Because I saw a, a troop of theater people resetting that clock just a second ago. That's right. Yeah. That's right. How do you reset the clock of destiny? It's a real question because I saw a woman up here falling down and getting up again to speak the word of truth. That's right. That's right. How do we get past this? By recognizing the beauty that we see all around us and not letting anyone at any time diminish that beauty. That beauty within us shall not be defiled. Yeah. So what I think Martin, what I think uh, 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 William Barber is striving for, that sort of national call for moral renewal, is that magnification of that which is already best within us. Mm. How do you let it out? How do you let it shine? That's the, that's the beautiful question before us today. So when they were singing in Longkesh about Bobby Sands and Mahatma Gandhi and Fannie Lou Hamer and Bernadette Devlin and uh, um, Bobby Sands, the song is asking us to remember that we're part of the same tradition, we're part of the same family. So when we struggle for justice for one, we're truly struggling for justice for all. That's right. All right. Yeah. May we be the ones. May we be the ones that seek truth and justice. May we be the ones.
then show us how to remember the best that is within us and to show our government, plead with our government, demand from our government, demand from ourselves and from our leaders that spiritual energy that pushes us forward. Thank you. It's a blessing to be before you. All right. All right. sing another song. This uh, is a song by Pat Humphreys, who came of age uh, during, during this, you know, 50 years ago when this original campaign was happening. She came of age during the uh, time of the shooting at Kent State, uh, when unarmed students were shot down by, by the National Guard for protesting war. Uh, it's also on the little song sheet. And this, this sort of this, this sensibility we're, just, we're, we're, we're hearing about and thinking about that we're going to we're gonna move forward with vision and change the world together. We're gonna keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. We are strong and bold together. Strong and bold together, strong and bold together, never turning back, never turning back. We will fight for peace and justice, fight for peace and justice, fight for peace and justice. Our children courage, teach our children courage, teach our children courage, never turning back, never turning back. We're gonna change this world together, change this world together. Change this world together, never turning back, never turning back. We're going to keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, never Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see all of us here. Thank you for, for showing up. All right. Uh, my name is Nick Biddle. I'm with the Vermont Workers Center in Brattleboro. All right. Yes. All right Nick. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Officially, the post 9 11 wars have cost the United States $5.6 trillion. Whoa! The United States $5.6 trillion. Over 23,000 active duty. Over 23,000 active duty. Military families were on food stamps. Military families were on food stamps. In 2013. In 2013. Over 50% of kids in schools on military bases. Over 50% of kids in schools on military bases were eligible for free or reduced lunch. Were eligible for free or reduced lunch. Since 1998, since 1998, the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense cannot account for $21 trillion. Cannot account for $21 trillion. How much? 
How much? Twenty-one trillion dollars. That's two hundred and thirty-five years. That's two hundred and thirty-five years of the food stamp program. Of the food stamp program. Shame. Shame. Military spending in 2017 was $688 billion out of a federal discretionary spending, or and you know out of federal discretionary spending, only $190 billion was for yep. anti-poverty programs. Whoa, that's a shame. What? Nevertheless, what? somehow, in 2015, the military spent an additional Six point five trillion it cannot account for, and for which it has not one single receipt. Oh. Six point five trillion. That's way over. That's ten times. That's a hundred times. No, that's a thousand times what it was allocated. It's that means that while officially the government spent sixty-six cents of every federal dollar on the military, and only twelve cents on anti-poverty programs, in fact, it spent $90.66 on the military for every 12 cents it spent on anti-poverty. That's the more. It is not just as if, but it is that the war, the military is at war with the poor. Most of the resources to war do not benefit our troops. They benefit Wall Street, Raytheon, General Electric, Boeing, and private military contractors such as Blackwater. Criminal! In 2016, CEOs of the top five military contractors earned an average of $19.2 million. More than 90 times the 200,000 earned by a general, and 640 times the 30,000 earned by army privates in combat. So wrong. Immoral. Nearly half of female military personnel sent to Iraq and Afghanistan reported being sexually harassed, and nearly a quarter said they had been sexually assaulted. Shame! Shame. In 2012, suicide claimed more military deaths than military action. Mm. And as of September 2017, an average of 20 veterans died by suicide every day. Oh. As we gather this Tuesday, some of us are wearing carnations to remember the people who died while serving in our nation's military. We remember the Memorial Day's roots in black people honoring the graves of soldiers who fought in the Union Army to end slavery. slavery and create the possibility huh? of reconstruction. You don't know. We honor each person who is willing to serve when we cry out against unjust war and war making and unnecessary military spending that robs the poor here at home. Yeah, that's right. that's we remember right. those who have suffered moral injury and died from suicide and from the loss of limb and mental stability. The truth is that instead of waging war on poverty, we have been waging a war on the poor, yeah. at home and abroad, the for the right. final, for the <laughs> financial benefit of the 0.1%. Right. Hey. While it is morally indefensible to profit from perpetual war, it is evil to perpetually war for profit. That's, That's right. right. We have the right to protect our communities from the ravages and weapons of war. We demand an end to military aggression and war mongering. We demand a stop to the privatization of military budget and, and any increase in military spending. That's right. We demand a Veterans Administration system that remains public. Yes. Yes. Right. We demand the demilitarization of our communities on the border and in the interior. We demand an end to the federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. That's yeah. right. All right, yeah. Our next speaker is Adrian Kin from Woo. the Vermont chapter of Veterans for Peace. All right. 
Veterans for Peace is a global organization of military veterans and allies whose collective efforts are to build a culture of peace, to understand the true causes of war and the enormous costs of war, with an obligation to heal the wounds of war. Adrian. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, so many of the things that I was going to speak about today have really been covered in right. such Save fine, again. fine, Save fine again. ways. Save again. But, you know, one thing I've been thinking about, I served 10 years in the military, and I now I'm going on my 11th year in peace work, so All I'm right. very happy to have yeah. the way tipped in the other's direction at this point in time. But, you know, I think back to when I first got out of the military, and first started really questioning in 04, 05, 06, what we were doing in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, what we we're doing to people all over the world. And I don't know, it, it seems like too often movements get wrapped up in who is or isn't president or who isn't in charge or what, what party is in power. Uh, because it seemed like there was such a momentum in the peace movement during the George W. Bush years that evaporated when Obama was elected. And the last eight years, you know, people being involved in peace work, there were a lot of things still going on, mm -hmm. but the masses were gone yeah. because people were putting their faith in a system that has absolutely no desire to change for the benefit of the people. change, we got it. I mean, people have been talking about this spending quite a bit. The rod being the military spending, the little slivers being everything else. This did not change under Obama. It got worse. Drone bombing got worse. Our 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 military spending, our war profiteering our attack on the poor got worse. got worse. And, you know, I'm thinking and, and hoping that things will change and people will start getting involved again. And it only has to happen because there's no other option. Mm -hmm. no option. But, right. you know, peace work really is environmental work. Environmental work is human rights work. Right. Human yeah. rights work is yeah. poor people's campaign work. All right. and it's when we yeah. start getting all of these pieces fitting together, that we will be able to affect change. And what I hate to see is people still, even in the peace movement, even in the environmental change movement, even in the Poor People's Campaign movement, somehow thinking that we can be pro-military and support the troops while actually still accomplishing what we need to do to change the world and make it a better place. Mm -hmm. And we have got to question militarism. We have got to question the role our military plays in right. the United States and around the world. We have 800 bases around the world that are wreaking havoc on poor people worldwide. Oh. That's right. Oh. Worldwide. Oh. So I guess this is just my thing is that I know Veterans for Peace is, is a national and now actually international movement with chapters in England, Ireland, Okinawa, Japan. Um, Vietnam, uh, England, and growing, Woo! and it will be when we all start really connecting with one another, the world around, that we will achieve our goals. So right. I just yeah. thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing the momentum of this movement taking us forward. Yes. Yeah. Did you all, you know that? Do you feel that? Yeah. yeah. National call for moral revival. Right. Gotta change. Come on. Right. As we engage in our third week of direct action, the nation has just paused for Memorial Day weekend. 
listening to many, including veterans in this movement. We chose to focus this week on our challenge to militarism and the war economy, as well as the proliferation of gun violence in the U.S. We believe the greatest patriotism for moral agents is insisting that America become a more perfect union. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Come on. We are here. Are we? Are we here? We're here. Come on. We're here. Come on. To reclaim legislatures at the people's houses across America. Yeah. Today, some of us will carry American flags to symbolize the unfulfilled promises to which our people have sacrificed. Veterans who know the hypocrisy of this nation. Today, we honor the veterans who live and die in poverty while corporations make a killing on killing. Oh, that's right. oh. Wow. We are here. We are here. We are here. We're here. We're here. To protest the killing of innocent black, brown, and red people at the hands of police. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. We also remember those who die from the proliferation of guns on our streets. That's right. And the militarization, militarization of poor black and brown communities here at home. Mm -hmm. This is why today we are outraged. Are you outraged? Yes! yes. Outrageous! About the 250,000 people who will die this year because of low wealth. While we invest over $700 billion. $700 billion in a bloated military budget. That's right. Ain't right. Come on. We declare that as long as 140 million people live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of this world, none of us, none of us are truly honoring those who gave their lives to this nation. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. As long as systemic racism cripples our democracy through voter suppression, and as long as this administration weaponizes deportation, even deporting veterans and their family members, we are not honoring liberty and justice for all. Yeah, yeah come on, come on. Our next speaker is David Papirski. He is a resident of Winooski, a veteran, has experienced homelessness, and I have been honored to work on the Vermont Poor People's Campaign with him. He's a member of the Vermont Workers Center. He's been active in the fight for universal health care and opposed to frat gas. He traveled to DC to join the Poor People's Campaign when it launched on May 14th. And I'm proud to introduce to you David Papirski. Yeah! Come on! Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is David Papirski. I am a member of the Vermont Workers Center and the Vermont Poor People's Campaign. I have been asked to speak today about American militarism and its war economy as I am a homeless vet who presently resides at the Canal Street Veterans Homeless Shelter in Winooski, Vermont. On January 8th of 1977, I turned 18 years of age. I was in my final year of high school and I had joined the Marine Corps. I thought it was a good idea at the time as I wanted to learn some valuable job skills and gain work experience to arise from poverty. At least this is what the Marine recruiter and my society's culture had told me anyway. In retrospect, it became the worst mistake of my life that I compare to jumping out of the frying pan than into the fire. I should have joined the Peace Corps instead of the Marine Corps. What I found in my six years of service were either vets that had just returned home from Vietnam 
or new recruits like myself from unhealthy home and school environments who are misled to believe that they would escape from living in poverty by joining the military. Now, now 59 years of age, I find myself homeless for the fourth time. Needless to say, I have never been able to break free from living in poverty. One out of every four homeless people are vets. About 400,000 vets experience homelessness every year. On any given night, there are over 40,000 vets on the street. Every month, 1,000 vets attempt suicide. Every day, 22 vets die from suicide. That's almost one per hour. Oh, no, no, Come on. no. That is far more that is dying in our endless, senseless, costly, unsuccessful, damaging, and traumatizing wars. Countries never win at war. Both sides always lose. Yeah. Always. Always. Vets typically suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol, and drug addiction. Some of these drugs the VA itself administers. Self-blame for mission failure, depression, anger, survivor, survivor guilt, and other mental Ill illnesses. Physical injury, a high number of both men, both women and men are victims of sexual violence by other military personnel. Poverty, high cost of housing, and in inadequate health care. Rarely is it ever discussed as to what the individual loses in war, nor is it discussed what our country truly loses. Let's discuss the financial cost of war first. Mm -hmm. In 2017, the military budget was about $773.5 billion. It is expected to soon climb to over a trillion dollars wow. unless we do something to stop it. Shame, 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 shame. 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 This cost does not include foreign aid and externalities, such as rebuilding a country we have just destroyed, utilizing multiple government contractors. These funds include arming and training a new foreign army to buy our political will. America spends more on our military than the next nine countries combined. Wow. Mm. Despite only having 5% of the world's population, we spend over 50,000 of 50% of the world's total military expenditure. Also understand that all of our tax money that is spent on war is profited upon by the rich. Yeah. Burlington simply does not need 24 nuclear capable F-35s at well over $100 million each. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. No. This money could be better spent on health care child care, yeah. teachers yeah. and nurses yeah. salaries, right. Right. supporting the disabled, yeah. Right. Yeah. affordable housing, yeah. Yeah. higher wages, yeah. Yeah. increasing the SNAP program, yeah. Yeah. Come on. ending racism, yeah. Yeah. ending yeah. poverty, yeah. Yeah. ending environmental destruction, yeah. 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 And, provi right. and provide affordable access to college and job training. Yeah. 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 Come on. America could work to heal itself and become a respected leader worldwide instead of perpetually being at war and both hated and attacked by most other countries. Mm -hmm. That's right. <clears throat> I just so happened to serve between 77 and 83, one of the few periods in our country's history when America's military have been at peace. Most vets have not been as lucky and are much, off, and are much worse off than myself. They live in the woods or commit suicide. Being a homeless vet is a direct reflection of America's unhealthy culture and war economy. The twisted culture that encourages an 18 year old to join the military in what amounts to killing other people like ourselves, other poor people like ourselves, in a foreign countries because there are no better alternatives here in our country. The most difficult hurdle for a homeless vet to overcome when seeking help from an inadequate system is to trust the very same unhealthy culture that made them homeless in the first place. Then they are rewarded by being reintegrated into an unhealthy society and living in poverty 
while our country perpetuates this cycle by enlisting new recruits for a never-ending war. While vets never really return home from war, some never return from living in the woods while they hope and pray that someone will listen and finally put an end to our war economy. Come on, David! All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, we're in the home stretch now. All right, somebody's been hurting my people. It's been going on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. We won't be silent anymore. We're going to gather up our moral witnesses, come up here behind me, and just in a minute, we're going to make a procession over. This is the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. We're in our 40 days of action. Every Moral Monday, today's a Truthful Tuesday, every Moral Monday, we will be out here on the steps of the Montpelier State House. Meanwhile, hundreds, thousands of our sisters and brothers across the country are gathered in 37 other states yeah! on their capital steps. That's right. We are making history as we gather here today to say systemic poverty is immoral. immoral. Systemic racism is immoral. immoral. The war economy is immoral. immoral. And ecological destruction is immoral. immoral. We're going to gather up, my sisters and brothers. We're going to take a walk around this side uh, of the state house <laughs> over to the accessible entrance. We're going to go inside our state house. Whose house? Our house. Whose house? Our house. That's right. We're going to go in there and we're going to continue this discussion that a war economy is immoral till we begin to make the change in our call for a national call for a moral revival. So I want you to all come up and close up and join up. We're going to I'll see you next week. walk together. Those of you who have banners on sticks, please leave those over to my left, to your right. Don't take those inside. You can take any good cardboard sign with you and bring these along. Avery's going to start us off with a song as we leave together. We want to all be together, let nobody left behind. We want to give our garden crew a good shout out for all their good work putting in the flowers. Thank you, garden crew. They did a great job making the world a more beautiful place. You, my sisters and brothers, have made this world a more beautiful place being here now. Now let's go inside and make the capital beautiful together as well. Yeah. Forward together, not, not one step back. back. Forward together, not one step back. Forward together, not one step back. Forward together, not one step back. So let's join together here. Come on, my sisters and brothers.